Good morning and welcome to day two of IDTX 2023. Thank you for uh, thank you for so many of you joining us first thing. Um, this is very exciting. This is very early in the morning for me for these three days. It's uh, it, it's been an interesting experience. I've drunk a lot of coffee. Um, yesterday was a fantastic day, and I just want to kick off by thanking everyone who attended, who spoke. Um, but it's time to move on already because today we've got an amazing lineup of speakers, our busiest day ever um, as a single day, an IDTX event. And that all starts right now with the wonderful Sarah Wood. Um, this is a workshop session, so please do get involved in the chat. Uh, we want to hear from you. Um, but without further ado, I will get the heck out of the way and hand over the reins to you, Sarah. The stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody, and good morning or good evening, wherever you're at. Um, could I get a shout out? Um, can you tell me how you're feeling today? Use emojis if you want, or if you're in a chatty mood, type it in the chat. I'm interested to, to connect with you over the comments because I know I can't hear your voice. So I'd love to, I'd love to see how you're doing today. How are you? And then... I'd like to see the chat. Um, Tom, I'm not sure if I'm getting comments through. Ah, oh, there we go. Hi, Bruce. Yeah. Hi, Jacob. Oh, we've got some really excited people with some woohooing going on. That's fantastic. Did you guys attend yesterday? Well, I did, actually. I was able to dip in and out yesterday. Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> I was able to dip in and out yesterday, and I was really impressed with the, the um, <laughs> I was really impressed with the content, and I'm really excited to engage with everyone here today. Um, and I want to, I want to talk about, um, as, as you know, I want to talk about onboarding single professional hires today. Um, <laughs> Deborah, yeah, I feel you, Deborah. I am. Um, I I was wanting to address this topic because I'm really interested in onboarding. I think that as an L and D function, we have a big part to play in that, in ensuring that our people get the best start to their career at in in where, wherever organization that we're in. Oh wow, snow in Surrey, amazing! Wow, good luck, Jane. I hope that you're able to stay safe on the roads today. Um, I, I I work in um, an organization called BT. So those of you in the UK know what BT is, but those of you outside of the UK may not be aware. It's a telecoms company. We own the well. We <laughs> BT owns um, a lot of the the network across the UK for um, internet and broadbands and telephones. So um, my my role is within the B two B section of BT. So I I support salespeople. Um, and as they sell our products to other businesses. And a lot of the work that I do is taken up with onboarding. So this has been on my mind for months and months and months, if not years, because I've done onboarding in the past as well. Um, and the different needs for the different audiences when, when it comes to onboarding specifically is something that I find quite interesting. So I thought it would be worth examining that in a bit more detail. So um, that brings us on to the next slide. How can we meet the needs, the onboarding needs of single professional hires? And I was thinking about this and I, and I realized that the term onboarding could mean a lot of different things depending on what organization you're in. There's um, some, some L&D functions work very closely with the recruitment teams in the HR and other L&D functions are quite separate. And at the minute I have the latter one and I work quite separately to our recruitment team. So I have to really work hard myself to get a good, a strong relationship with the HR function and speak to them and understand that audience's need a bit better. Um, so the term onboarding could also be synonymous with induction or orientation or employee socialization or maybe something else. So I wanted to put it out to you guys in the chat. What do you think, what does onboarding mean to you? What, is that, um, what does that actually mean? Is there a time limit to it? 
Does it happen? Does that start when? Does it start before they even apply for the job, their awareness of the organization? Does onboarding start when they get that um, that job offer? What What are your thoughts? I'd love to, I'd love to get some feedback from you guys on that because I think that that answer influences how we address the needs of the audience. I think the trouble with this is that the chat shows up quite. Uh, quite slowly. So I'm going to keep talking while you guys are typing. Oh, Thomas says onboarding starts at hiring with my team. So at hiring. So that is the the job offer and beyond. A smooth start of the journey into an organization. Yeah, smooth start is a really important one. We as when when we put ourselves in in the um in the, in the mindset of someone who's starting it's, it's a nerve wracking experience to change jobs, isn't it? And you want that experience to be something that feels organized. It feels welcoming, um, not, not chaotic and, and confusing. Um, getting new hires up to speed with company culture and team dynamics. Definitely, definitely. Um, an ultimate opportunity to make a positive first impression that should start before they even join. New colleagues should feel welcome before day one. I agree. I agree with all these comments. They're really insightful and really interesting. Um, and I think as um, turn, turning this, this thought exercise back to our own experiences as L&D professionals, I don't know about you, please shout out if you have a different experience. But every time I have joined an organization as an L&D professional, so a single professional hire, my onboarding experience has not been really awesome, I'm afraid. I think that L and D, we 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 don't even love ourselves as a function. We're we're the ones who get the last bit of time and attention to our own training, to our own needs as a as a as a function within the business. And um, so I've I've joined organizations, been very excited, had had a great perhaps pre onboarding experience from when I received the job offer, the HR recruitment team made it a great handshake experience. Then I get on the job and I meet my L&D manager and he's like, well, just have a look at these files and I'll come back to you in a bit. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, okay. Um, so there's there's a disconnect there, I think, that is is um, it helps me to build up some empathy for the people that I'm trying to create um, this onboarding experience for as well. So I wonder I wonder if I could put that question out to you guys as well. Do, what has your onboarding experience been like as an L&D professional, as a potentially single professional hire yourself? And is that something that you've experienced that's positive, that has changed your outlook on the organization itself? Uh, the formal induction can be weeks after you join, which it almost, Catherine, you're right, because that can, that when that happens, do you feel that that is useful information if you've already been there a few weeks or does it feel a little bit too late? I mean, that's a, that's a loaded, like a leading question, I think. So I've, I've worded that a bit in a bit of a leading way, but um, I'll, I'll leave it to you to answer, actually. Jennifer says informally, it can even start during the interview that that understanding of an organization, their culture, that that welcome, definitely. Thomas says, mostly terrible, which has informed how I now design said processes. Yes, 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 and yes. I think it's really, really um, crucial. In fact, the research even shows that it's crucial. 69% of employees are likely to stay at least three years after they have a great onboarding experience. And 87% of new employees are less likely to leave within the first year after a great onboarding experience. And we're talking about single professional hires. We're talking about people who are expensive to um, keep in a business and there's, they're expensive to hire in the first place. So if we, we have a high churn because we're not doing a great job with the onboarding experience, then um, we're, the business is losing money, frankly. And we, we as an L&D function need to keep that in mind as well, that we can support the business in saving money through designing um, uh, an onboarding experience that meets the needs of this audience. 
Catherine says it feels like lip service when you join an organization. Yeah, I feel the same. That's definitely happened. I think that there's that 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 um, that disconnect can really be hard to push through, and it and it does it does really make a massive difference. You're right. The statistics speak for themselves. I've got a bit more more information, a few numbers that we can we can talk through um, at the end of this presentation if if people are interested, um, because I find it really really interesting. The research it definitely speaks for itself. It's really obvious that that those first impressions not only impact how we feel in the moment, but they last a very long time. Bruce says, looking for employment in LXC and ID, interesting to hear of people's previous experiences, especially during COVID. Um, 3M used VR to onboard new professionals. That's interesting. I think that there's it's 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 inconsistent, perhaps, Bruce. So we have some people who have had good experiences, some not so good, and and I think that that inconsistency is is important to pick apart and to understand. I would say, um, in terms of what you're looking for, in terms of like new employment, I find um, it helps to examine that onboarding experience and to consider, is this a red flag in an organization? How do they actually feel about L&D? Um, and is, is it incorporated within the business? Is it valued in the business enough for there to be that integration and that, that smooth transition between the HR recruitment team into the L&D function? And if there's a disconnect, why is that? It could potentially mean that, that L&D is, is siloed off in its own little corner and we just, we just use them as and when or there could be other issues, but it's something to be aware of, I think. Catherine says, induction should focus on what the individual needs and not be a vehicle for pushing company info that could otherwise be shared using resource hubs, et cetera. That's a really good shout, Catherine. I think that that's, that's something that I've been um, really wrestling with myself in some projects that I've been working on because the individual is, um, their needs are different from one from one hire to the next for a start. So how do you cater to that that individualistic approach without without losing like the the focus of the the actual cost of it for the the business to run? So for example, we've we the a project that I'm working on now, we've decided that it's it's not financially feasible for the business to run um, uh, an onboarding uh, program. Uh, hosted by a facilitator. So who's hosting that? Well, it'll, it should be the manager and the local team so that that new hire is embedded in that local team. And that way, that individualized approach can be easily pivoted and flexed and catered to because the manager's right there supporting that new hire. For retention purposes, we need to ensure that new colleagues realize that they've made the right decision to join the company from the start. Absolutely, because it calls back to those statistics that I quoted out that, um, you know, obviously, if, if we have a large number of people who, um, who feel strongly that that first year makes or breaks their, 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 their longevity at, at an organization, we need to listen to that feedback. We need to understand it. So what we've we've kind of answered the question, how can we meet the onboarding needs of professional hires? We need to listen to those needs. We need to and then we need to approach it in a in an individualized way. Would you agree with that answer as we've talked that through? I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to move on in a second. Oh, Thomas says 100 um, percent. I keep forgetting that there's a lag. So I'm asking a question and there's a lag. So I'll, I'll move on to the next one. And if anyone wants to pick that up again, please do. Please challenge me as well. I, I'm, I'm not here to say that I know everything. I'm here to, to listen to your your feedback as well. So I. I have children and I just, it amused myself to call on um, the, the wisdom of Dr. Seuss, big A, little A, what begins with A. Um, and what I want to talk about is the analysis side. We, we've kind of touched on that already when we're talking about um, connecting the, um, the HR function and the L&D function and making that process as smooth as possible. When how do we do that? How do we how do we figure out how to make that process as smooth as possible? Well, we need to analyze that. We need to look into it a bit deeper. There's also an element here that I thought would be worth considering in terms of how we how how we deliver this this experience to to a single professional hire because 
we're, we're not going to be able to um, create an individualized approach that is prepackaged, really, are we? We're not going to be able to create something that we can tie off with a bow, give it to someone, they open it up, and they consume that, that training because that's not an individualized approach. So we're going to have to leverage things like social learning experiences. But that's not always an easy thing to, to actually create um, because the, the, the content needs to be role relevant. It needs to be suited to the business needs and function. It needs to um, meet the needs of a lot of different requirements. So I'm wondering about how we, how we take advantage of a challenging situation in that way where, where we have, and the way, and the way I'm going to talk this through with you, and I'd, I'd love your feedback as I speak. So as there's there's a recent project that I've been working on for single professional hires, and we the the analysis phase of that project has taken months because I've I, my approach has been I've um, spoken to stakeholders like in the C-suite, and I have spoken to the local managers, I have spoken to the um, operations team. I have gone to a site and um, had a meeting with the people who are doing the job day in day out, and I have I have leveraged the the support from our manager's coach. So we've got we've got a, a manager upskill coach that he supports the managers specifically with their skills, and um, the sales methodology coaches. I've I've spoken to as many people as I possibly could to get this that like the the biggest picture to understand that that need and what i've what i've come to realize is that a lot of the behaviors that i want to um that i that i want to um apply a lot of the things that i wanted to do for the program i realized that it was already taking place it just needed to be formalized it just needed to be kind of put on rails as it were and given given some some formal guidance and and support there's um, the the opportunity there has been, well, we've got social learning already happening, but it's not happening in a way that's structured that allows for scaffolding of information, it allows for um, a streamlined, easy way to, to um, absorb that information over time. It really is more of an info dump, deer in the headlights, make or break. We've literally lost people within the first year because their onboarding and development experience that first year has just been um, too too much, too overwhelming, too confusing. So um, just dipping back into the chat, Catherine says, the induction resources themselves can be prepared in advance, company info, forms, templates, processes, FAQs, yes. Then we personalize the wraparound experience through the use of social communities, a one-to-one -one narrative with the buddy or line manager. That really is 100% the approach that that I've taken, Catherine, and it's it's required it's required a lot of a, a lot of thought. Um, however, because you want to make sure that um, if you're introducing, well, this is my thinking, and I and please please um, pipe up if I'm if you think I'm wrong. I'd love to hear that too. But um, my approach has been. If people are already doing this, then it'll be easier for me to leverage that behavior that already exists, just give them a bit of support around it. So if they're already doing a buddy system, which they were, then I just give them some guidance on how to get the best out of that relationship. If the manager is already sitting down and having coaching conversations, then I just remind the manager how, like the coaching program and the, the guidance that we have within the organization and how we expect them to run those conversations. I also remind them that they need to set up a cadence of calls with their new starter, that they need to um, regularly check in. And this, I already know that they're doing it. And I've, I've spoken to managers and I've said to them, how do you feel about me telling you this when you're doing it anyway? And they're like, no, no, we want guidance. We want to be able to not think about it when we don't need to onboard someone and then go to a place, internal SharePoint, where it has a list of things to do, checklist, guidance, reminders, and then use it. So that's been really interesting that I've been able to develop um, a relationship with them where they can they can tell me that quite bluntly. 
Thomas says having a knowledge base helps so much with this process. Giving them access from the contract sign allows them to hit the ground running from day one. That plus an onboarding bundle sent out to them sets them up for success. I agree. I think that um, when we're when when we're looking at the human side of this and how people feel, because as, as we all know, um, our feelings impact our ability to absorb information. If we're stressed, if we're in that fight or flight mode, we're not going to be able to take things in. Whereas if we have the information we need and it's all laid out and it's organized and it's and it feels like that smooth process, we're able to absorb that information better. And that's really what we want for people. So another thing that, that I've discovered is um, this idea that let's just be open. Here's your here's your journey with us. This is what's going to happen within the first month. And that'll be up to be between you and your manager to uncover what happens next. However, by the end of the first month, you should expect to have received this information. You should have ex you should expect to have spoken to these people. You should expect to have seen your your systems, your your login, your laptop, all that kind of stuff, all the all the nuts and bolts of it. All this should be happening within those first few weeks. And then let's look at your development. Let's look at month two. Let's look at month three. And not only do we say this is vaguely where you should be, we also really signpost and say it's between you and your manager because going back to that single professional hire, these people already have a lot of experience. They come into the role because they are experienced, right? So they know what they're doing more or less. It's getting to know the company culture. It's their ways of working and potentially other products if they're in sales and stuff. So there could be differences, but leveraging that that um, knowledge base that already exists within that new starter is, is also really, really useful and important. So, so the analysis is um, obviously something that we really need to um, to have a clear understanding of that audience, of how that um, that person fits into the organization, how potentially they may be feeling, how that the, all those interactions with all the other org, um, teams and within the organization as well. So um, Bruce says managing the cognitive load of the onboarding process. Who are the key contacts exactly? And all of that can't, it, it needs to be something where we're not expecting someone to manage, like remember that information or memorize it. I mean, who, raise your hand if you remember the first week when you start a new job. I get to the end of the first week, I feel like my brain's going to explode. I'm freaking out because I'm like, I don't remember anything about how to do anything. I barely remember my name. So all of that, we need to make sure that we're not overwhelming them by expecting them to memorize anything or um, keep hold of it. Just here's access to the things that you need and you can go back to it at any point. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about the analysis as well in terms of like how we, how, how we figure out what the best solution is, because I think that there are a lot of there are a lot of similar threads here and it doesn't really matter what organization you're in that we we can we can pull together and say well this is the basics this is this is the best practice um and louise that's a great point i think that some level of autonomy should be allowed for, for these their professionals who know how to work in organizations absolutely we're not going to be we're not going to be treating these people as if they're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed 18 year olds in their first job these are these are seasoned professionals who who have been hired for that reason and so what what i've really um tried to capitalize on that from that point of view is say Here's, here's a vague path that you will be able to transverse and travel at your pace. So we're not going to lock information behind a door that you have to test to, to get. If, you've, if, you, if you're ready, if you're there, if you're in month two, but you want to look at the content that we have earmarked for month six, do it because you know you best. Um, <laughs> the worst part being introduced verbally to a whole room of people and then immediately forgetting their names. This is why I love teams, Catherine, because everybody's name is right there under their picture. Love it. I'm so bad at names. <laughs> 
Um, so I wanted I wanted to to explore a little bit about um, what kind of questions would you ask or have you asked in the past about um, at the in this in this analysis phase of a project like this. Um, because one of the things that I really, really like to do is I like to look at the job descriptions. I go to the I go to the hiring team and I say to them, how do you even get these people through the door? How do you entice them to even apply? What is it? What does the job description look like? And I read through the job description. I um, I speak to them about like their hiring process. And um, and I and I discover things like, oh, they're headhunted. Why are they headhunted? What are they looking for? And who are they? Who are they going? Where are they going to? What skill set are they looking for? What's the history of that? Though those people's work that that means that you want to headhunt that audience. Olga says we could also learn a lot from people who don't work in the company way. So pushing processes and SOPs on them could be even detrimental to growth and improvement. Olga, that really touches on an important point. That so I really appreciate you mentioning that because it's it's jogged my memory and something I wanted to mention is is the the accessibility aspect of this process because we want to make sure that we're we're um, designing something that meets the needs of all sorts of different people um, and neurodiversity and physical disabilities, all the whole gamut of the accessibility requirements. We need to make sure that we're we're thinking along those lines as well. And um, people who don't work in the ways that we expect, we need to we need to flex around that as well and support them in, in the way that they think and, and, and work. Um, so does anybody have their, like a standard question that they would ask in a, in a, in an analysis phase of a, of a project like this? Like I was mentioning earlier about how I like to look at the job description and speak to the hiring team and understand the process of hire, because I've worked for, I, I've, I've, I've worked on projects for these single professional hire, um, audiences. But as I've also worked on projects for a call center audience where they do big recruitment drives and they bring in all sorts of different people, but mostly it's it's a it's a younger cohort with um, a much shorter job history it, uh, and they consume information differently. They behave differently in a training experience and knowing that audience as intimately as I possibly can really um, informs the decisions that I make further on. And I know you guys know this, but I just thought I'd put that out there because there are lots of things that we need to be asking ourselves when we consider the needs of this audience specifically. Um, another thing that I really like to do is I like to get to know the managers quite closely if I can, because we're the the audience that I'm that I've designed for in my most recent project, they have very low churn. So we're looking at hiring um, less than 20 people a year, if that. The, the people that are in that role, tend, if they stick around, because obviously I mentioned before that someone left because their, their onboarding experience wasn't um, as consistent as it could have been. Um, but most of the time people get into that job and they stay. They like it and they stay and it's a great team atmosphere. And um, so it's important for me to understand the managers and how they interact with their team. Thomas says, I asked the stakeholders, managers for that area, to create an ideal day one employee in a workshop. Then we designed the process to deliver that and push back when they expect too much. Also, a lot of focus groups with people reflecting on their onboarding experience. That's that's a great shout, Thomas. I've I've done this, I've done similarly, not exactly the same as what you described there, but I have done similarly. And and um what, what I really enjoy about that is um, because I'm outside of their normal scope of their um, reporting and all that, I can get some honesty in the room. And so I can just say, well, what's worked and what hasn't? And then I just sit there and I let them vent. And um, and it's a great way to build strong relationships with people as well because I'm um, I'm there to solve a problem for them. So they're telling me what, what their problems are. And then we work through ways that, that we can realistically solve those problems. Catherine says, carry out research with existing colleagues and ask about their induction experiences over time. Find out what the FAQs are. What did you need that you couldn't find out about? People rarely say that they needed more colored sticky post-it notes and corporate branded pens. 
Ah, uh, love it, Catherine. Love it. It's true. It's true. The the stuff that the stuff that is the fluffy bit that that feels good and oh yeah, I've got a branded bag and all that kind of thing. It's not really what we remember um, as what our experiences were about. Um, they make great LinkedIn pictures when we start a new job, but it doesn't actually um, help us to to get the best experience. Access to that kind of honest, transparent info is great. Yeah, it really does help. I, I also try to I try to make it clear that like my my ability to solve all those problems is limited. I'm in a very large organization with lots and lots and lots of cooks in the kitchen. There's lots of people who influence various decisions. But I can say to them, I will raise that as a risk. I will raise that as a potential problem. And I do speak to people and I do try to pull on strings and get people involved. Um, one, one example of this is in my previous um, projects before before the, the, the single professional hire one, when I was working on um, um, the uh, call center one, for example, we had for for that that team we had kind of a bible of all the information all the product information that they needed when they were on a call with a customer and um we used that bible extensively in building our training so we would say okay here's for example here's a here's a case study you need to research this customer and you need to use this product bible as as a as a means to develop a, a solution for that customer, so that was that was an activity that we we deployed in that in that area. Um, I uh, naively assumed that every area in the business had this product bible that their salespeople used. So when I when I um, started this project, I thought, oh great, I'll use the same ideas. I'll I'll have them do that data mining practice. I'll have them. Um, build skills, build habits of delving into that um, really important, um, you know, one, one source of truth sort of thing. Um, but of course, they don't have it in this space. And that really threw me. It was really, it was really difficult to, um, to undo my, my um, expectations. And I had to dial back and I'm like, okay, um, I could complain about this or... I could build a sense of FOMO within this team and say, look what these guys have on, on in the other team. They've got one place they can go to get all their info instead of going to this, this knowledge management tool and this internal website and clicking into this file. They've got it all pulled together in one. Wouldn't you like something similar? And then we speak to the 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 right team who could get the job done. And so though setting those wheels into motion and that influencing piece has has been kind of a, a fun uh, spin off of um, what I'm doing for the project. Um, so creating the right solution means that we need to understand all facets of the requirement. But I think that um, doing so means that we may end up with a little bit of analysis paralysis. We're, we're, we're asking lots of questions. And I almost feel like I'm like, lifting a rock and looking at the mess underneath and going, Oh, no, oh, no, what do I do? And I could go off on this rabbit trail and that rabbit trail. And then I get stuck because I am th this isn't necessarily now a learning need. It's a learning need plus an operational challenge plus we need more budget and all, all of the other issues that could be uncovered. Um, okay, Catherine, keeping printed resources up to date can be almost impossible. Although call center employees can't always access an on-screen resource at the same time as using call center software, having access on a tablet to a knowledge base could be an idea. And that's great because, and that, and that actually, thank you so much for that comment because that kind of um, reflects what I was just saying now about how you're you're uncovering operational difficulties that is not a responsibility of L and D but it is something that we can raise. So as part of our analysis, we can say, right, this is the, the, the issues that we can address with this learning solution. Yeah, <laughs> get through all the eyes across an entire organization, especially in a big one, it is a challenge. Um, but this this opportunity, it, it does create an opportunity. So I'm, I'm, I default to quite a Pollyanna positive outlook. But it does create an opportunity for us to lift up the the entire um, the, the entire section of that business, for example. So we can say, look, 
operationally, they're, they're running into difficulties. One of the difficulties that we have, um, because we've got this disconnect between the HR um, recruitment team and L&D is there's, there's nobody to bridge that gap between um, before your first day and on your first day. So it's up to the managers to scramble around and to order the, the equipment, get all the logins, get them, get them systems access and all of the other really nitty gritty stuff that would be easier if there was a dedicated team to um, to communicate between those two sides of the line, but there isn't. And so that really brings a lot of challenges to what we design. There was, um, there was a solution that I designed that um, depended heavily on all the new starters having their laptops, having systems access, by day three. And I naively thought, oh yeah, day three, that'll be fine. It'll, Cause they have the, all of day one to do all that nonsense. And by day three, they'll, they'll have it. Some of the, some of the new starters didn't have access for like two weeks. And it was just, I, I felt awful for those facilitators because everything depended on that systems access. It was really, really tough for them. So um, that, that just kind of ma- makes, it makes our job um, difficult, really, to 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 get that smooth and, and positive experience. But it also gives us that opportunity to raise those risks and to and to work with other teams and hopefully improve it over time. I worked with a client last year, Thomas says, that built an onboarding team for exactly this reason. The impact was huge, both in terms of employee confidence and operational efficiency. Um, it's. I, I mean, calling back to the statistics that I that I mentioned at the beginning, and and I'll and again I'll, I can go through a few more, or I can send them out to you if we run out of time. It is vital. It is like it when I I was I was completely convinced by the numbers because if we are talking about the impact, the financial impact on a business when they're hiring people um, who leave within the first year. It is so expensive and the higher your churn rate, like you're, you're potentially losing millions. And, um, and it, so it just is, it makes sense to fix it before it, it turns into a problem. So when we're talking about lifting the lid on something and finding stuff that we can't fix as an LMD function, how do you, how, how do you stop that from, like from your from your project from getting arms and legs as we like to say in in my in my team the the it's outside the scope this project is like turning into a centipede what how how do you pull back on that do you do you have something that you do as a default or do you have a skill that you deploy do you um or do you just say no what is, what is it that you do when you're in this situation because it's I think that thinking that through is really important because we've gone through this process of where we understand the audience, we understand the need, we go in and talk to the people, we let them vent, we we develop these relationships, we realize as probably anyone would, that these these problems that we're trying to fix are bigger than just a learning need. There's other issues, there's cultural issues, there's... Um, bad habits that have been embedded over years and years. There's operational issues. Um, there's budgetary constraints. There's lots and lots of things to consider. And um, I, I, I've i learned over time that um, being really strict with myself and going back to the scope and going, okay, this is, this is what I scoped out with my, you know, with, with my stakeholders. And I've discovered this, this, and this. Some of this I can fix, and some of it I can't. And how do I how do I feed that back? Um, I would be interested in any any of your experiences in in that situation. Um, the um, one one of the things that I that I like to do is I like to remind people that um, we're prototyping it. So I've I've used this a lot. It's uh, Olga says no easy way around. It would require a very honest conversation with main stakeholders. Absolutely. Um, one of the solutions that I found that really helps is at the very beginning of a project to be really clear and say, um, and this is doesn't, it's not always possible. 
obviously, but but if you can, and if you have support from your management team and, and your L&D function is to approach it with the stakeholders and say, we're taking this as an iterative approach. There's no way that we can get it right first time. Um, and we're not expecting to, we're expecting to get do the best we can with the information we have now, but we will need more information to make it better over time. So then if you can, if you can hold fast to that sort of a principle where you've got an iterative approach, then you can then say in that feedback, that's outside of the scope of this iteration. And we are, we'll, we'll look to that after we get data from phase two, for example, like what Catherine said here. So Olga says, um, oh, I've read out Olga's um, comment, haven't I? So Catherine, super clear, agreed variables from the start. Anything else that is identified as being beneficial can be added to a phase two of development or we'll never launch anything. Perfect. Unless, of course, something flies out of Pandora's box we've opened that's critical and needs to be launched. Exactly. I think that's a great attitude to have. We're iterating. We'll look at that in phase two. However, if this is an emergency situation and we got to deal with it now, then, of course, we'll flex around that. And that ambiguity is something we as L&D professionals really do need to be comfortable with. Definitely. Thomas says, um, as an external partner, we provide a set of recommendations that span everything we think will work towards a solution, but ultimately it will always be an MVP followed by a lot of iteration. I think that's great. Um, uh, that really helps me um, to validate my thinking and my approach. So I appreciate this feedback as well, because I, um, a as, as time goes on and I gain more confidence in my approach, it helps to understand that other L&D professionals are doing the same. So that's, that's really helpful. You guys, thank you. <laughs> Um, so that kind of brings us to like mostly the end of what I wanted to discuss, because what we're looking at is designing with the end in mind. What we've talked about is understanding the needs of the audience and looking to meet those needs from the very beginning. And as we go through that process of analysis before we even get to the design phase, we can keep that in mind. And we're talking about that iterative approach and ensuring that um, we aren't getting outside the scope of the project to begin with, but also with that flexibility of understanding that sometimes that needs to happen. So that's that's been really interesting to discuss through that um, today with you. And and I just wanted to say as well, like we we're creatives. We have we we need to use data to um, to ensure that our our um, our designs are sound that there's logic to them, but also we have that creativity, that flexibility and our professionalism and our insight and our understanding of the way people learn. This is why I'm really excited about being an LMD because there's so much to it. It's so layered and so um, multi-pronged. And, and, but again, it comes down to our relationships with people and 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 leveraging that with our with our stakeholders, understanding people's needs, keeping that mindset of, what does that person feel like that single professional hire? What is, what are they thinking when they start and how can I support them to grow within the business? How can I help them professionally to feel comfortable, confident, to hit the ground running as, as quickly as they can so that they will stay with us? Oh, Olga, that's such a good point. Have all agreements written. Interpretations can mess up any good intentions. That is a fantastic point. And I think that there's lots of different ways to approach that. Um, I am really keen on email trails, as simple as that. Or you can um, have really clear outputs after a, an agenda meeting. So I have working groups that I host every two weeks with my with my. Um, uh, managerial team that is um, that is supporting me with de designing a project, and they're they're my stakeholders. They're my my key stakeholders. They're down on the ground. They're giving me insight as I as I work through the development of the project, and I will send them out an agenda saying that I you know I'm I've got thirty minutes of your time. I'm going to use it wisely. Here's what you can expect from me, and then. Um, after that meeting, I then send out the the what what we agreed to to achieve until the next meeting. So all of that is written and clear, and um, and and it and it builds those really strong relationships with them as well because they know that um, what I say I'm going to do, I'm going to do, 
and they have confidence in, in what, what the outcome is going to end up being. So that's really good shout, Olga. So I just shared a little bit about how I deal with it. Um, if there's any other questions, I'm just looking at the time. I cannot believe how quickly this 45 minutes is gone. And I'm so grateful to you guys for the feedback and interest that you've had in, in today's session. It's really been um, enlightening and, and enriching. And um, I wanted to keep in touch with you. Please do give me a shout on LinkedIn. Let's connect. If you want to talk any more about it or if you want a copy of this slide deck, I'm happy to send that to you because as I said before, I've got some statistics that we now do not have any time to run through, but they're interesting. And I've got links in, in, um, in those slides as well so that you can see where that information has come from. So that is me done. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. That was really fantastic. Um, if anyone does have any questions, um, now's the time, I guess. Um, We've got if, if there are questions, we do have a little bit of time because the session after this is actually uh, actually. Well, it's not in the thing anymore, but it was cancelled. So we have oh, we have okay. some breathing room. Um, oh, OK, no, so that's if people great. do have questions. Don't feel like we have to uh, cut off. Well, I mean, I think that we're all on the same page. I mean, it's been really mm. great reading other people's comments. I think that we're coming at it from a really similar perspective and that I find really edifying. And it makes me feel like, right, phew. <laughs> I'm on, I'm, I'm on the right track with my approach here. That's great. <laughs> so, uh, th well, I mean, one thing I guess that I, I wanted to ask is um, I think scale plays a really big role in kind of the onboarding experience. So, for yeah. instance, like yeah. um, if I take my company as an example, we're a tiny company. So when we onboard someone, it's a big deal. Right. It's, you know, we're adding what we're potentially adding like a sizable percentage to the team every time we hire someone. Um, whereas I know when we work with clients, they might have, you know, 10,000 employees already. So whilst yeah. every employee is important, the relative impact of one person is significantly less. Um, so how do you or you know, how would you go about kind of balancing that difference in terms of what you would suggest or the approach you might take? Well, I think that's really interesting. And I think that what I've discovered working in a very large organization is that it's actually a collective of tiny organizations within that umbrella. And mm. it's really been interesting. And perhaps it's not the same in every every large organization. But I feel like that's probably right to say, because I go in to um, with with all of my experience i'm like oh i know bt oh yeah i've done i've developed this before i'll go into this new project and i'll i'll get to know the people and it'll be fine and all of a sudden i'm like i'm in a different world i don't know what's going on i don't know what products they sell i know nothing and so i'm starting from scratch from um you know from a from design approach obviously i've got experience but it's like okay i gotta i gotta rethink everything and i can't come in with some bias because i don't actually know these people and i don't know their way of working um so it's it 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 almost doesn't really matter how big the organization is now i think that the difference isn't necessarily size but it's the churn how many yeah. how how many people are they hiring on a regular basis? Because when you're like in a call center, for example, uh, like these kids that show up, they're like, "This is just I just work here so I can pay for the weekend. This is not my career. I'm not bothered. I'll work for the summer and I'm gone." Um, whereas other people, it's a career and they're they're in it for the long haul. And that attitude of 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 the team impacts the design choices as well which I found really interesting. It's made, it's made a difference in, in how I approach things. Awesome. Um, um, we do have some questions. Yeah, um, we do. Should we go there? Um, Olga uh, may, may have covered this start. I'm not sure we did actually, um, but what was your best onboarding experience? Well, this is funny because my best onboarding experience was when my laptop was sent to the wrong house. <laughs> I was, I had a great boss, but he typed my address wrong when for, for the IT team to send my laptop. And so I was like, it was my first day and I had to log in on my personal laptop to the teams. And my boss was just like, oh, I'm so sorry. But it was the individualized approach. It was like the hand holding. It was the, it was the, um, it felt just human. It felt real. 
Um, and I, and, and that, when I look back on that, I'm like, that was actually nice. It was funny. It was a little bit stressful, but it was also really nice to have this, okay, my manager isn't some lofty, perfect person. He actually made a mistake and he owned up to it. And I immediately saw what the team culture was like, because other guys were ribbing in, being like, oh, did you send my stuff to that house? And it was all just like, this is the way they work. They're, they're professional, but it was casual and kind and thoughtful and all that kind of thing. So it actually gave me a really quick and easy insight of what it was going to be like working there. And I love that guy. He was, he's the best manager I've ever had. It was great. So that's kind of a funny one. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, oh, so it's funny enough. It's almost like complaints handling. It's not about the complaint. It's about how it's handled after the fact, mm -hmm. right? Something can go yeah. wrong and it can still be a great overall experience. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question or if it's just a comment, but um, worked in some large corporates, making process changes with cross-functional stakeholders takes some navigation. Certainly does. Uh, the impact of getting it right or wrong is huge. So it's definitely worth the investment in time and effort. Um, yeah. Oh, and you human. mentioned the word I was about to type, human. Everything needs to be human. It's about people first. Yeah, I mean, we are a people function, aren't we? We're part of the HR function. We are people first, definitely. And we can't design anything without that in mind. 100%. Totally agree. Fantastic. Well, um, but unless there's anything more from anyone, um, I really want to take the opportunity to say thank you so much for this. It was a fantastic session. And it's really great to reflect on this because it's a process that I always kind of think onboarding is almost the one universal, universal thing that training will at some point touch in every business. Um, but for that reason, sometimes it doesn't get very much love. It kind of gets ignored or, oh, yeah, we got onboarding, but then we get to do the good stuff. Um, yeah. like, well, that yeah. is the good stuff. Everything else is a bit, you know, processy. But onboarding's fun. Um, so this was really, really great. A great way to start day two. Um, as I mentioned before, everyone, we do now have a little bit of a gap. Our next scheduled session um, is actually one that I'm, I'm uh, hopefully you all enjoy it as well, but I'm really looking forward to this next session. Um, it's with Simon Day creating a design led theme in Adapt. Um, so many of you may know I'm a big fan of the Adapt framework, um, but it's a little bit tetchy, a little bit technical. Um, Simon's whole job is just Adapt. It's all he does. Um, wow. He was part of the team that created it. Um, so he's going to show us how to really get the most out of that platform in terms of theming. Um, but that starts at 11.45. So we've got just short of an hour. Um, you can go forth, do whatever you want to do, unless you're here in the UK and it's snowed heavily where you are, like it has here, in which case I'm not going outside. Um, <laughs> but uh, the session space is open. The networking area is open. Um, what I'll likely do is grab a coffee and go and sit in a session. So if anyone wants to drop in for a chat, you're more than welcome. Um, but if not, we shall see you at 11.45. And uh, Sarah, thanks once again. Thank you. Sleep well, Jennifer. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>